Catch the latest news on our website, tribune.net.ph, and follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel, Tribune Now. The Daily Tribune is one with the nation in facing the COVID-19 crisis, and in line with this, the Daily Tribune Digital Edition on Press Reader is now available for free online. You can also download the Daily Tribune app on Apple Store for iOS users and Google Play for Android users to get the latest and most comprehensive news online. Daily Tribune is also inviting everyone to join its community Viper Katribu to get updates on the freshest and hottest news and entertainment stories of the day. Tarsito emoticons are also available on our community Viber. Just click on the link in this video to join. Good morning everyone. Hello mga katribu. I'm Tina Maralit and this is Straight Talk where we bring you to the front seat of the hottest discussions regarding the hottest issues in the country today without fear, without favor. And for today, we are very fortunate to be joined by two very esteemed personalities who I'm sure will engage our resource persons in a very colorful meeting of the minds. First up, she was a two-time President of the Investment House Association of the Philippines and an active member of the Financial Executives Institu Institute of the Philippines, Management Association of the Philippines, Institute of Corporate Directors, and Philippines Finland Security. She's also the chairman of the Multinational Investment Bank Corporation, the oldest existing independent in investment house in the country. Friends, let's welcome Ms. Marilu Cristobal. Good morning, ma'am. Morning. And of course, next, he has a long list of credentials and achievements to his name, among them as consultant, capital market specialist, and as president and director of AB Capital and Investment. He also has an extensive experience in corporate finance, mergers, mergers and acquisitions, corporate banking, trust and fund management, and stock brokerage, and has actively participated in the discussions with legislators and regulators regarding various capital market-related bills such as PERA, and the SPV laws. Friends, let us welcome Daily Tribune columnist, Mr. Sinen Bing Matoto. Good morning, sir. Good morning, Tina. So I'm very looking forward to hearing what we you have you have in store for us today. Like I told you before we started the show, I'm very much willing to be schooled by the two of you today. So I'm gonna turn it over to you now, Sir Bing and Mamarilu. Thank you, thank you, Tina. And good morning to everybody. Uh, thank you for listening in. And uh, today, this morning, we have three great guests from the Banco Central of the Filipinas who will be sharing with us some of the latest uh, initiatives of uh, BSP. Uh, I'd like to introduce first off uh, Lynn Javier. She is the managing director of the policy and specialized supervision subsector under the financial supervision sector of BSP. She oversees the supervisory policy and data departments of the central bank, as well as the supervision of specialized areas, specifically money laundering, information technology, treasury and trust operations. She is a UP graduate. We also have, uh, in addition to Lynn, uh, we have um, Zeno, Zeno Abenoa. Zeno is a senior director uh, of the Department of Economic Research of the Banco Central. He undertakes research activities to support the formulation of monetary and financial sector policy for the BSP. He heads a technical staff of the advisory committee. Uh, Zeno obtained his MA in economics from the University of the Philippines School of Economics and his master's in public administration in economic policy management from the Columbia University. And then finally, we have uh, we have Mel. Mel is a director. He's in charge of technology risk and innovation supervision department. Very important uh, area, particularly in this area in this time of a lot of cybersecurity concerns. He's over had a decade of supervisory experience in the BSP, and he has certainly seen the evolution of technology as it pertains to the banking system. Without further ado, uh, I would like to start off the ball rolling in a straight talk conversation with our guest from the BSP, 
And I'd like to address this in general to all three of you, and you may feel free to respond, whoever may wish to respond. For the past uh, week or so, we've heard uh, BSP Governor Diok, and by the way, we should also extend uh, our, I, we hope that uh, Governor Diokno is uh, recovering from his uh, emergency medical procedure, which uh, apparently was necessitated by an accident over the weekend. But uh, in any event, uh, the governor has been, uh, in fact, a guest speaker in quite a few uh, events. More particularly, last week, he was our uh, induction officer at the Phoenix. Prior to that, I thought I, I saw him also on uh, another uh, webinar, where he again talked about the overall economic situation of the country. And more or less, everything that the governor has talked about has really been, how should I best put it, uh, nice and sunny for, for everything going forward, notwithstanding the uh, plight of the pandemic. So I have to really ask you uh, the question of, uh, apart from the fact that we are optimistic going forward this year, I would like to ask any of you to, to perhaps comment on what might be keeping Central Bank or any of your particular areas awake at night, thinking about what could sort of erupt again, another black swan event. Lynn, would you like to sort of react? Yeah, um, yes, uh, good, good morning, everyone. So I, I'll just um, share our views based on our monitoring from the supervision side. So we're closely monitoring the quality of assets in the banking industry. Right now, we're at 3.8%. That's higher than the 2.2% um, level um, last year. So we, we believe that the um, we haven't really seen the full impact of the pandemic, and we'll be seeing it by the first quarter and second quarter of this year because because of the grace period implemented by banks, some um, assessment of the quality of um, the loan per Hold has been delayed, but we're quite confident that um, this will still remain within manageable levels, and we're seeing banks um, increasing their provisioning as well. So it's anticipating potential losses in their portfolio. Um, um, also, to mention that the banking industry entered into this crisis um, with um, capital position and liquidity position. So. Um, in addition to that, we're also quite um, busy pursuing some initiatives also as far as the supervision sector is concerned. For instance, we are pursuing the accelerated digitalization of the financial industry and the BSP has also recently launched a digital payments transformation roadmap. We have also issued the sustainable finance framework because we believe as, as banks gets to review, reset, their strategies because of the pandemic, they already have to embed the sustainability agenda uh, moving forward. So I guess as my, my colleagues could further, I mean, add some points also. Can I make a follow-up question to your question, which is taking a more macro view and maybe uh, uh, for uh, uh, Colin Zeno to respond to this. As, a gov as, as being mentioned, the governor has taken a very positive view of the prospects of the economy in 2021. Uh, and I guess this is in sync with the expectations also of our, of the country's economic managers. But one of the big concerns of most economists uh, as a result of the pandemic is economic scarring, which is, you know, longer lasting uh, damage to economies uh, that can be seen through sustained high unemployment rate, continuing weakness in investment, et cetera. And I was wondering, Sina, whether uh, the rosier picture notwithstanding that you think we might have some vulnerabilities, that there could be some sectors that uh, have been or will be mortally wounded and unable to recover. Could the economic scarring be a concern for us? Yeah, okay. Uh, thank you, Malu. Again, uh, good morning uh, to you and uh, and Bing, and uh, thank you for inviting uh, BSP uh, to your show. Uh, this is indeed a very challenging time. Uh, last year, we saw the economy contract uh, after almost a decade of a continued uh, successive expansion. We see we saw the contraction of the economy in quite a, a big way. Challenges on on how to recover. Uh, from these economic conditions. 
Uh, you cited one of the concerns that we have, uh, which is uh, how to limit uh, possible scarring effects, long-term effects of this contraction last year. Uh, the, the labor sector has been hit uh, last year and there are several sectors, service-related sectors like tourism, uh, uh, getting uh, a bit of uh, the, the large part of the, of the shop. Uh, remittances uh, have slowed down, have contracted, but not by as much as was uh, initially initially uh, forecasted by by analysts. And here we, we emphasize why we 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 have a view of optimism uh, on the outlook. Uh, last year, uh, at the towards the end of this year, we have seen some green shoots, possible signs that the economy could be on demand uh, uh, by, 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 by this year, uh, registering uh, positive growth. The, the target for this year is at least negative, at least 6.5% uh, growth for GDP. But we have seen since last year, mobility indicators uh, show an uptick. Uh, economic activity is, uh, is uh, beginning to go up in, in certain areas. Uh, if we look at high frequency indicators, the business sentiment uh, uh, shows some slight turnaround based on our uh, sentiment survey. Uh, business sentiment is on a small net positive. Household sentiment also saw a turnaround, but still it's pessimistic, but not as uh, pessimistic as in the second or the third quarter of, uh, of last year. So there are some, some green shoots. And the BSP uh, is prepared to continue this uh, accommodative monetary policy stance to support the economy, uh, to support the recovery, and limit possible uh, scarring effects moving forward. We want the liquidity to be ample. We want the financial sector to be uh, effective and efficient in uh, providing credit and uh, support the, the uh, strong bounce back of the economy. Zino, just one follow-up uh, question. You mentioned uh, the accommodative monetary policy adopted by the BSP. Um, how long can or should the BSP adopt that kind of policy? We're working on a negative real interest rate scenario, and obviously there are winners and losers in that kind of a, a, a scenario. Uh, what should we be watching out for that will signal that the BSP may be changing course. Yeah, yeah, Malu. So uh, uh, at the outset, let me be clear that right now, the although I have said earlier that there are some green shoots, uh, definitely monetary policy uh, posture uh, remains uh, accommodative and supportive of the economic uh, recovery. Uh, uncertainty still prevails, uh, and given the underlying conditions, we think that this accommodative stance is appropriate. However, if and when conditions do improve and the recovery uh, is firmly on track, then the BSP is also prepared to eventually exit uh, from the various measures that it has uh, implemented in the past. And uh, it is crucial to emphasize that this exit, this withdrawal, will be a gradual process. It will be deliberate and data-driven, just like the other uh, actions that we have done before. Now, what about the pace and the timing of the exit? Now, the pace and timing will depend on our assessment of the inflation outlook, what is happening in terms of uh, inflation expectations, and the robustness of the economic recovery. We want to make sure that any withdrawal of uh, accommodative policy uh, will be done in a scenario or in an environment where economic recovery is firmly underway. We don't want to derail any uh, the recovery due to a premature withdrawal. And this is true whether we're uh, talking about monetary policy or even some of the regulatory relief measures uh, that we have implemented since last year. Yeah, if I can sort of uh, chime in, uh, I guess this accommodative uh, stance has also enabled a lot of banks to experience actually a great amount of uh, liquidity. 
your lowering of reserve requirements as well, no, has contributed to this. Uh, and yet, um, lending has really not been as, I would say, as aggressive a uh, uh, push that I, I would imagine that we would like to see to be able to stimulate the economy. Uh, what would imagine typically be happening would be uh, banks using the liquidity to actually reinvest in uh, in government securities or depositing right or with back. the BSP, it goes back to the BSP. I guess the question I have is really: Are you are you thinking at all of any any mechanisms to be able to sort of squeeze it a bit and cause banks to uh, to move into lending rather than investing in BSP? For example, um, could there be a default structure where if the uh, if the uh, investment levels or if the actual investment is made by a, a bank with uh, the BSP, uh, that there is in fact some sort of a default yield given. So that then they're really, by way of yield and cost, they're really forced to go into the higher yielding corporate risk assets. Because right now, that's what's happening. Uh, you've got BSP pumping in liquidity. Banks are great, are happy. Of course, they're shoring up their, their liquidity. But then they're also reinvesting at relatively decent yields with the BSP itself. What are your thoughts? Uh, maybe uh, Lynn may have some comments regarding this particular uh, view. Um, um, actually, during the pandemic, we've granted our relief measures um, aimed at incentivizing bank to lend to the industry. So this uh, includes lower, lowering the risk weights for loans granted to MSME. Um, delaying or non-classifying certain accounts as past due and non-performing loans, as well as staggered booking of allowance uh, for credit losses. But but I get I guess the, the strict quarantine measures at that time also somehow affected the demand for 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 for, for loans. But we're we're seeing um, I, I guess favorable indicators, positive indicators right now. For for instance, um, the the MSME loans as reserve requirements as of um, December thirty. One, uh, 2020 average at 162.8 billion pesos as compared with only 8.7 last April 2020. Now for large enterprises, it's at 33.3 billion. <clears throat> so um, we, we are quite um, optimistic that we will be seeing loans um, uh, to pick up in the coming months as um, the stringent um, measures are slowly being lifted and then um, households and businesses um, already proceed with their normal activities. Is there still anything in the BSP arsenal that could perhaps get credit flowing a little more vigorously? That's all, that's, that's one of the, uh, I guess, points also being discussed. Yes, go ahead, Sarcino. Uh, well, yeah. I mean, I think the point, uh, the point really was, for example, the yields that the BSP provides the uh, the banks who deposit straight back with the BSP. Wouldn't there be some sort of a, as I said, a sort of negative? Are you suggesting neg a zero or negative interest yeah. rate and make it expensive certainly, for the banks to go back to the BSP? Yeah, certainly something that you know will be an easy decision on their part. Oh, I'll just reinvest with BSP and go for it, rather than actually saying, okay, yeah. who can I lend it to? Or I realize I mean, the portfolio sort of moved up, but some of the corporate sectors are also sort of looking at uh, some some support, liquidity buffer. You know? And I don't think that has moved up as dramatically, or certainly just barely moved, I think, relative to, to what it was in the previous year. So is that at all within the thinking of the BSP? And maybe throw, throw, in, throw, in, that throw in more carrots, maybe uh, provide great uh, relaxation in the agri agra compliance, get more loans eligible as uh, you know, agri agra compliant uh, lending or or some ESG uh, loans that can be given some incentive, a little bit more carrot on top of maybe the stick that Bing is suggesting. And Bing has just lost friends from the banking system. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So if if I can add uh, being Malu to what uh, Lynn has just mentioned. So right now, 
the, the BSP has uh, done, uh, has infused about uh, 10, a liquidity of the amount of about 10% of GDP. So that's a lot, that's a lot of amount of liquidity into the system. Uh, it has resulted in a good domestic liquidity dynamics and uh, continued uh, effective market functioning. But as was mentioned, as both of you have mentioned, uh, we want this uh, accommodative stance translated into more credit uh, activity. And when we look at what is happening, uh, it, uh, while, while there is still some room for, for monetary policy to, to, uh, to come in and uh, fiscal regulations have also been adjusted a lot, uh, we can see some of the limits to monetary policy. In an environment when there's a lot of uncertainty, the sentiment uh, remains, remains weak. And here, uh, I emphasize two things. Uh, to be sure, there's still monetary policy space. It has gone down, but there's still space. Uh, uh, we have uh, reduced interest rates to uh, the lowest level uh, since we started the, the inflation targeting in the, in the modern uh, monetary framework of, of the BSP. And uh, we have reduced uh, reserve requirements that has infused a lot of liquidity. But in order for that to translate, into more activity, uh, market confidence has to go up. And here I go to the second point. We, uh, we support the whole of government approach uh, in this particular issue. We need to solve the health problem and we are doing that. So the, the vaccine uh, news is, is very much welcome. It will uh, facilitate the opening up of our uh, restrictions and it will invite more activity. And second, uh, fiscal policy will also continue to play a, a major role. Uh, in this environment, it is uh, more targeted and uh, it, can, it can target certain sectors. It can support uh, activities of both firms and households. And that is what the government is doing, ramping up uh, its expenditures uh, in order to support investments and uh, consumption of, of households. So we, we have done a lot uh, on the part of the BSP. We hear you that there could be other uh, adjustments that can be done, but all of this, we, we, we do it, or we, we first analyze what is happening in the economy, and if there's some necessity to do an, an action right now. But we have already infused a lot of liquidity interest rates are at a low time level, and we think the other policy levers uh, could help uh, increase the traction of monetary policy moving forward, even as we are prepared to act if needed uh, moving forward. Yeah, Thank you. well certainly, I mean, don't get me wrong, uh, certainly the BSP has in fact done its job, and I have to commend BSP for really the kind of stance that it has taken. I was really referring more to the private sector, how they sort of get them going with a little bit of push, as I said, on, the, on your part. But anyway, maybe we can move on to uh, the digital. We've got Mel here, who's been sitting on the sideline for a while now. Uh, you know, there was this digital banking circular, of course, that had come out, I think, what, was it 2019? or? And um, I wonder, has, there, has that attracted any uh, interest at all from any sectors in terms of people or banks applying for a, a license? Yes, B. So there are, uh, it has attracted a lot of interest from new players, from existing players that want to digitally transform their institution and uh, adopt a digital-centric business model. So yes, there are a lot of interest and we will uh, uh, we have started already with with, a, with the first application, processing of the first application, and as, as it, it will always start with the licensing process, and then and then there's really and there's the, there there's the, the Lin may may want to add uh, other details about the digital banking circular that was recently issued. Can I can I just before Lin responds and maybe yeah. this, uh, my question? Yes, Malu. Form part of the response of Lynn or Mel. Um, 
obviously digital banks are very different from the brick and mortar uh, traditional banks right where you have the you see the branches you see the offices and digital banks they exist more in you know in, in a totally different sphere how are the trust issues in digital banks uh, should customers be watching out for certain things in dealing with digital banks different from how they may be dealing with the traditional banks yeah so you mentioned about i mean the trust issue so there are in while there are a lot of differences there are also a lot of similarities so how do we ensure that there's trust in our digital banking institution first of course it's we are prioritizing the cybersecurity posture of not only digital banks but also existing players we're also very particular with respect to money laundering to ensure that these institutions are not used as vehicle for money laundering and of course consumer protection we need, we need to make sure that they have uh, consumer assistance mechanisms in place to ensure that the clients can can uh, i mean can raise their concerns can get assistance from them yeah um I, on the on the digital banking i mean uh, perhaps uh, you know you talked about a lot of interest, Mel. Maybe Lynn can also chime in. Uh, is there interest also coming from some of the fintech companies that have been operating uh, in terms of converting themselves into a digital bank? And then talking about fintech, if you take a look at the model of fintech, they really thrive on fees, on transfers mostly, rather than any other types of commercial transactions. Uh, would, in fact, digital banking with its fairly high capitalization requirements as compared, I would imagine, to fintech. Would it really prove to be a viable proposition for, for banks? And is their interest also coming from overseas? Uh, in terms of, uh, while we cannot disclose, uh, but there are a lot of interest also from existing uh, fintech players. Unfortunately, uh, again, we cannot disclose yet, but they haven't uh, formally applied yet, but there are a lot of interest. In terms of business proposition, I think uh, because right now most of the fintech players cannot, especially the e-money issuers, cannot lend. So with the digital banking, they have the opportunity to to lend. And uh, in terms of uh, revenue, that would also essential that would be a potential source of of uh, revenue for them. Yeah. And Lynn, yeah. if I may, go okay. ahead. Just um. Just, just a short comment on the digital banking capital requirement. We actually set it at that level to ensure that the players in the digital banking, um, um, I was the, the digital bank applicants would have strong value proposition and um, strong financial um, uh, position as well. Because we, under, you know, we were cognizant that the risk attendant to this business model, it's 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 quite high. And their reach is quite massive. So we have to ensure that they have commensurate capital to address and manage this risk. Lynn, quite apart from the capitalization requirement, are there BSP regulations that are specific to digital banks that do not necessarily get applied or imposed on the traditional banks? Okay, before yeah. po, before sagutan ni Ms. Lynn ang tanong ni Ms. Malu, uh, more of Straight Talk when we come back after this short break. Okay. 
all. And you're still watching Straight Talk with our special guest hosts for today, Ms. Malu Cristobal and Mr. Bing Matoto. I'll turn you over back to them. Thank you, Tina. I think Malu had a question yeah. and Lynn was, and, and Lynn was uh, eager to answer before uh, we need to give way to the commercial. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, we, we actually flagged in the digital bank circular that a digital bank is like any other ordinary bank. It's exposed to the same um, set of risks like any other ordinary bank. And, but we, of course, emphasize effective management of IT, cybersecurity, and AML risk because, you know, uh, heightened risk exposure because also of the platform that the digital banks would be using. But one, um, I, I think, unique requirement uh, for a digital bank is they only have to establish one branch. Mm -hmm. So one physical presence, one physical. So other than the touch, just one physical presence to address consumer complaints or consumer issues. It's, it's like a touch point also for regulators. So that's, a, that's one, um, I guess, requirement unique to digital banks. Yeah, well, one thing that uh, I think for the public uh, that has been utilizing, of course, uh, digital uh, tools to be able to transact day-to-day Activities. I'm referring, for example, to transfers, money transfer payments or services rendered. Transfer fees are still being charged right now by the by the banking system. And I know there's been some move regarding. Uh, I thought they were hold. That's what I wanted to know. I mean, I wanted to know along that line. I mean, it sort of runs contrary. In other words, you know, you're you're making a payment for a relatively small amount, for example, for a simple purchase from a grocery. Then you'll be charged a certain flat fee. Uh, I can appreciate that uh, the banks need to solve cover costs, but at the same time, for for small transaction values, and I would imagine that's the bulk of the transactions. You still have these fixed fees, which really, at the end of the day, will be quite costly to the to the consumer. I mean, are there any thoughts? or any measures that the BSP is thinking of, again, to try to sort of cause our banks to be a bit more friendly? Yeah, it, uh, I'll answer that being. So sure. in terms of, Go ahead. I, I think in terms of fees, you are now charged only for making fund transfer. I think yes. for purchases, uh, you are not charged for purchases. So for fund transfer and remittance, you are charged. And basically, uh, we don't fix the amount that will be charged. But, but essentially, uh, the regulation requires, I mean, observance of certain principles, right? The pricing should be market-driven. It should be uh, reasonable and uh, transparent to the consumers. So it's essentially, the, the, and the, speaking of fees, uh, uh, Probably the, the the it created a lot of noise the the the, the moratorium on ATMP and soon um, the bank will roll out a new pricing regime which we call uh, uh, acquirer based uh, pricing model. So it's essentially the it will start by I think probably by the second quarter of uh, this and the range would still be between ten to eighteen. So that's why. While there are certain increases for certain institutions, but essentially it will allow more transparency because the consumer can now choose among the ATMs, assuming that the consumer, let's say, is in a mall. He can choose among the ATMs in the mall and pick the uh, ATM that offers the lowest cost. But I would just like to clarify that this would only apply for all when you say off as transactions, if you do transaction outside your bank. Yeah. If I, but for transactions within your bank, you, you will still be charged zero. It still remains free. Yeah. If I, if I may, I mean, based on my own personal experience, uh, because when you make a payment, when you make a purchase, if it is uh, to a merchant that has already been designated by you as the accredited transferee, in other words, you specify already, and there's a limit to how many merchants you can specify as compared to situation where you see online, there's something being offered by another online merchant and you want to pay. And then they'll, can, you can simply des they can simply designate an actual bank account instead of c considering them to be a merchant. So a bank, at least the bank that I bank with, 
they would not charge if it's a pre-designated merchant, but then they will still charge a fee if in fact I make a payment or I make a transfer to that account of that merchant, which could be a one-off transaction. So, I mean, I, I hear what you're saying, if it's a pre-designated merchant, but if it's just an ordinary transfer, as I said, in a scenario where it's probably likely that you can have a consumer just having one or two transactions and would not necessarily want to designate that merchant as a, tra as a merchant transferee, thus eating up whatever uh, would be its limitations. I mean, that was really where I was coming from. You may want to look into that. Uh, so normally, yeah. Yeah. So normally being when, when the payment will be done within the same institution, when the recipient is in the same institution, most, I mean, I think more, uh, all of the banks uh, don't charge for that. It will I'm only charged. charge if that, if, yeah. Are you, are you, you're charged? I, I get charged <laughs> because I always specify, give me the bank account of this specific bank. When I make a transfer, I still get charged. I mean, so you may want to look into that. I, can, I hear what you're saying. Maybe yeah, yeah, if you yeah. tweak it, whether it's a merchant where you designate it or if it's a, just an ordinary transfer within the same bank, I can understand that. Then that would be fine. If it's going to be a different bank, then maybe there's a fee. But at least maybe my you should change your bank, Bing. No way. I mean, I love <laughs> and find another bank that's friendlier to the customers. <laughs> Love my bank. It's just an observation. It's a small amount, but then for yeah, for yeah. you know for the ordinary consumer with a relatively small value yeah, transaction, it can be painful. So did we get it right that the BSP gives some leeway to the banks to decide on the commercial terms of their uh, uh, services to the clients? Meaning, if they want to waive it, put a flat fee, or make it a percentage, the BSPs. The BSP just provides guidelines on reasonableness and transparency. Is that what we're getting? Yeah, yeah, essentially. So in terms of, uh, let's say, I mean, you mentioned about commercial agreement. So in terms of the commercial agreement, we leave it to the... Uh, and these are, po are required to be posted in the branch so that the customer is guided on the costs of every type yeah. of transaction that they... Let's say, for example... In the new ATM pricing regime, so let's say, assuming that you're in a mall, uh, if you're not a client of this bank, you will be charged this much if you use this ATM. And then on the ATM screen itself, it will tell you that you will be charged, let's say, 15 pesos if you're not a client of this bank. Press uh, yes to confirm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. It, it, can I shift? Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, Sorry. Yeah. I was going to ask Mel again. You know, there's. I was reading last night this uh, trend, bank banking trend survey made by Accenture. It's a worldwide survey of different banks. Fortunately, the Philippines was not one of them, and it was published in November. And it talked about digital bank currencies uh, to replace fiat. No, I mean, in other words, with a new normal, when everything is being transacted digitally. Is this one area that the BSP is looking at doing? In other words, coming up with its own yeah. version of a digital currency? Definitely, we will get there. So, uh, because right, but, but right now, we are still, there are a lot of considerations. I mean, in terms of technology, in terms of the potential monetary policy, financial stability implication. So it's in it's within our radar. There's a dedicated technical working group that's studying that. But uh, one thing is for sure: the governor mentioned it won't happen it's in the happen within his term. It won't happen in his term yes. because there are a lot. Because we are also right now we are talking with different central banks. We are exploring different uh, technology. So there are a lot of uh, new ideas, and uh, we need to be very careful. We need to be prudent when it comes to central bank digital currency. Uh, While you're at it, um, Bing, can I just... Uh, that was cited that was really evolving now a digital currency because you've got already cryptocurrencies that some yeah. people are yeah. investing yeah. in. But instead of going into cryptocurrency, we don't know really what's backing it up. I think uh, a BSP bank backed uh, digital currency would, would really be very much acceptable yeah. to the public. The trust yeah. component... Yeah. 
I read there was a news article not too long ago that talked about the virtual currency transactions in the country. And the figure that I read for the first six months of last year was about 59 billion pesos, which was three times the level from a year ago, uh, from, from a year ago. Uh, could you, Mel, can you tell us what sort of transactions this might be? Because there are a lot, there are virtual currency exchanges that use virtual currency to facilitate remittance. Mm-hmm. So there were a lot of remittance transactions uh, that were facilitated using virtual currency. So that's primarily driven by that. And of course, uh, there are a lot of uh, interest because right now, uh, Bitcoin it has... Oh, re- yes. <laughs> More than 300% increase in price from so, a year ago level. It's a combination really of growing interest and of course the, the usual remittance, uh, I mean, VC, uh, virtual currency supported remittance transactions. Uh, if I may shift to another topic, I mean, sorry, Malu, did you have a No, no, go ahead, go ahead. No, no. Uh, and I'd like to address this to, to, to Lynn. Uh, I would refer to sustainable finance. You mentioned that very briefly in your earlier comments. Um, again, uh, we know that uh, you, you, the BSP has come up with this circular that is essentially uh, encouraging banks to work on a three-year transition cycle to really be adherence uh, in a more serious manner the principles of uh, sustainable finance. Uh, and yet, again, the whole world is really moving quite rapidly into that space. Uh, and we do have, I presume, still the commitment with the Paris Agreement to sort of conform, I think, is it 2030? So if it's a three-year transition that brings us to almost 2025, barely four or five, five years or so. And, and yet I would always sometimes see articles in the news uh, talking about new power plants that are going to be coal powered, which is very much against uh, clean energy. Uh, the question I have really is, um, although the circular talks about asking banks to move into that cycle, again, talking about the carrot and the stick. Uh, it, it was not terribly clear what the carrots are. For example, would there be some, it, could it be used in lieu of agri-agra or on the other hand, if it's a stick, would it be used to say, impose higher risk ratings on loans to non-green financing that banks will now be moving into? Yeah, actually, being the sustainable finance approach of the BSP, it is divided into three phases. The first phase is to introduce high-level principles in sustainable finance. So that's circular number 1085, which was issued last year. So um, we, we, we note your observation that it's a three-year transition period because we don't want to make it um, uh, to force banks actually to... Uh, quickly migrate or quickly embrace a sustainable finance agenda because we will lose the essence of learning and knowing and fully appreciating the value of embracing sustain- the sustainability agenda. The, the next phase of this um, policy approach is to issue more granular risk management guidelines. So we're looking at risk assessment, environment scanning on their exposures to climate-related um, risk. The third phase, this is where the incentives would come. We, 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 we actually thought that putting the incentives at the last phase will give us more ground in terms of ensuring that this will not be limited to a compliance exercise for for the banking industry. So what we're looking at is also some of the incentives granted in other jurisdictions. And we are um, also closely coordinating with other central banks in terms of potential um, incentives such as lowering risk weights. But you mentioned Agri-Agra. This is already included in the proposed amendments of the BSP to the Agri-Agri law, Agri law to um, investments in green initiatives as an um, alternative compliance or a form of compliance with the uh, Agri-Agri requirements. Okay, but something also, related to it. If I may also Please share, finish. we have this interagency group called the Green Force, the DOF, the Department of Energy, and all the other um, relevant government agencies are on board. So this would ensure alignment also of strategies and policy approaches across the, the country. Can, can I um, ask a, 
somehow related question. Uh, Lynn, uh, we understand that uh, effective last year that the BSP has changed its rating system for supervised institutions from a CAMELS uh, framework you have shifted to what you call supervisory assessment framework or SAFER. Marang yung acronym niya is SAFER. Uh, uh, SAFER, Ms. Malou. Uh, safer. <laughs> Kasi, <laughs> to reflect the safety and soundness uh, of the sounded, financial It sounded industry. like SAFER to me. Good that you corrected me and so it's SAFER. Uh, SAFER, um, if you get the low rating, Can you, can you share with us the thinking behind the shift from CAMELS to SAFER uh, to this new framework? Well, we... we we will revise the rating framework to make it more business model centric because different banks have different focuses and there are different drivers of income and risk. So this platform or this tool will actually allow us to do that, to be more sensitive to the risk drivers in, in different financial institutions. So this is financial institution agnostic. So we could apply this rating system to different financial institutions being supervised by the Banco Central. Unlike in the, the CAMELS rating for framework, the management component is actually overburdened. We charge the compliant risk, the overall assessment for IT, AMLA, and trust. They all feed into the M component. The SAFER now allows us to have more granular um, assessment and attribute certain weighting on depending on the, the driver, uh, depending on the, say, um, extent or significance of a business activity to banks' operations or a financial institution's operations. How much so of it, it's it like would be at, like, quantitative? How much would be a well, uh, quantification of Oh, okay. All our assessments are actually backed by our financial analysis based on the prudential submitted by the BSP, as well as the results of our surveillance activities. Now, SAFER is not really that different from CAMELS. It's like looking at your living room, I mean, from this perspective, and rearranging the furniture and looking at the same um, space in your home. So it's just like uh, looking at it from a different angle, emphasizing those big furniture pieces that you have. Okay. Uh, on something, uh, I guess, that's close to the hearts of uh, Phoenix, we refer to PERA. PERA is an initiative that Phoenix was quite involved with years ago. And of course, it became law and it's been implemented, but I really don't think it has gotten off the ground. I'm sure you're aware of that. Um, what do you think, uh, because again, as part of the initiative now of our new uh, president of Phoenix, Francis Lim, no? uh, he's saying that maybe we should take a look at uh, some of the existing laws that we have in place already. I mean, even Romy Bernardo, another prominent Phoenix member, uh, talked about looking at PERA, looking at the securitization law. You've done that already for the SPV law with, uh, I guess, with the, uh, the FIST, no? Uh, specifically with regards to PERA, from your point of view uh, as a BSP regulator, what do you think are the tweaks that we need to be able to have Pera more attractive and get greater traction from the public? Uh, pr probably just also to share where we are at now in terms of achieving the 5 million um, Pera investors in five years. We're now in the second phase, meaning we are doing some um, information campaign. So it, 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 it actually, there's two sides into this. It's informing also the public on the benefits of PERA and letting them know the, how they would how they could invest and making things accessible from their point. I think that the digitalization initiatives of the BSP, um, making all financial touch points accessible through your mobile phone will help accelerate and um, achieve that, that target of 5 million PERA investors in, in five years. We, we also agree with the observations of the private industry that there are some... Um, laws, um, issues that needs to be revisited. The Retirement Act, for instance, making um, the retirement benefits more portable, portability, the retirement benefits. We have the securitization law that's, that's actually different from the FIS law. The FIS law amended the SPV Act during the Asian financial crisis that would allow the banking industry to dispose of um, non-performing assets. And then we also have to look into the cross-selling framework as well. Okay. Well, I just got word that perhaps we have time for one last question. Um, 
Malu, would you like to do the honors? Um, well, uh, Lynn mentioned uh, or touched on the digital uh, initiatives of the BSP. Perhaps uh, in a nutshell, uh, Lynn or, or, or Mel can share with us the digital transformation uh, roadmap of the BSP and maybe share with us where they are and what sort of timeline they're looking at to bring them to whatever end point that uh, the BSP seeks to get to. If I may start, Mel, and you could just chime in after. The, the, the digital payments transformation roadmap of the BSP, it's actually a three-year roadmap. And we have twin objectives of um, achieving 50% of retail payments processed through digital means. So, and then that's the first one. The, seven, the second one is for 70% of Filipino adults to have financial accounts by year 2023. We're just at uh, 29% right now. So um, it's anchored on three pillars, digital payment streams. Under the digital payment streams, we wanted to showcase uh, use cases wherein, um, uh, say, the public would be enticed to use digital platforms in processing their transactions. The digital infrastructure where the Philippine National ID system would um, um, is also one of the identified priority projects there because through the uh, PhilSys Act, we know that we will be able to increase the number of Filipinos with formal financial accounts because the KYC would be much easier. And the third one is the digital payments um, governance standards. We wanted to ensure that we, as we move towards um, a digital economy or a digital ecosystem, we are governed by standards um, ensuring the, 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 the safety and the security of information being channeled and also the, the, the funds being transferred from one um, counterparty to the so there are a lot of initiatives under this framework. One uh, actually includes the open finance framework, which is under the Department of Mel. This would actually unlock the potential in terms of empowering our consumers to choose the financial product that they want at a, at a price that are, I think is reasonable from their perspective. Well, maybe you could also share the highlights of the open finance. Yeah, uh, as mentioned by Lynn, uh, we are in the process right now of finalizing the the open finance framework. So essentially, it's a, a secure, a safe means of sharing information so that it can, as mentioned by Lynn, it can empower consumers. It, it can, I mean, so instead of, let's say, the classic example would be, let's say, when opening an account, so in, you can just instruct, let's say, Bank B to provide Bank A your financial in, information securely so that you don't have to redo the, the, the process. So those are... That's upon the instruction of the customer. Yeah, Meaning it's always, upon the, it's always upon the instruction of the customer. It, it's always guided by the consent. Consent, consent is always uh, a prerequisite. Okay, thank you very much. I guess, uh, you know, with this, with our three distinguished guests of the BSP, we actually would need three different occasions to be able to discuss thoroughly a lot of these uh, topics that we talked about. But we cannot leave this uh, session without asking very practical down-to-earth questions of Zeno. Just one question. Where do you see a foreign exchange rate by the end of the year? Just one answer. Where do you see interest rate by the end of the year? I'll put you on the spot, but not necessarily the BSP officials. Uh, it ako. Uh, Secretary Secretary uh, Lopez said the, fa the the nice balanced valuation is fifty pesos there. So you're <laughs> against that uh, uh, statement of the secretary. Zino, you have the floor. Uh, yeah. So you know. for the BS for the BSP, the exchange. You BSP now. <laughs> <laughs> After the show, I can. <laughs> but, uh, after the show, maybe I can share a few more things. But but uh, for us at the BSP, we think that the market determined exchange rate uh, has served the country very well. It it acts as a shock absorber. But uh, the BSP is prepared to uh, put order in the market if and when there is uh, excess volatility that is uh, being observed. For interest rates, uh, the BSP interest rates. Uh, will be calibrated based on our analysis of what available information will be to make sure that it is appropriate to uh, support economic recovery and achieve our uh, inflation target, which is okay. 2 up 4%. Okay. 
So he's spoken year. like a true <laughs> banker. Uh, no specific direct. <laughs> uh, thank you anyway. Baka lang makaka lusot yung katanong ko sa'yo. Anyway, with that, uh, we thank you ladies and gentlemen for uh, sharing with us this past hour of your time and we hope you found this straight talk. I hope it's not too much of a straight talk but we hope you found it uh, meaningful and informative. With that, I would like to turn it over back to our studio host, uh, Tina. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you. Thank you for having us. Thank you, Ellen Zeno. Thank you. Ben. Thank you. Thank you. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today. Thank you again to Mom Malu and Sir Bing for being our guest co-hosts for today and to our friends from the BSP for your very insightful uh, comments. Yeah. And, uh, and um, so that's that's that has been straight talk for this week. Join us again next time. Stay safe, everyone. <laughs>